Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday recap of all things space news, starship, rocket launches, and space history. There's actually quite a lot of stuff I want to cover this week, so let's hit the ground running right after I shamelessly remind you to ensure you're subscribed so that these news videos are indeed new when YouTube decides to notify you of them, of course. Anyway, with that being said, on to our first segment, a rundown of all the biggest Starship news that we saw develop last week. The test prototype at the forefront of everyone's attention right now is, of course, Starship SN11 which we had hoped to see make a high altitude flight last week, but it looks like it's still firmly on the ground at the moment. SN11 has been at suborbital pad B since the 8th of March, undergoing cryogenic proof testing four days later, and on the 15th of March it made its first static fire attempt. However, all three Raptors cut out immediately after ignition due to a test abort, but last week, on Monday the 22nd of March, this was re-attempted and was successful. The hope was then for a hop the following day, but it later transpired that one of the rocket's three Raptor engines needed to be removed for repairs and replaced. The engine was swapped out, and on the 26th of March, SpaceX conducted a third static fire test, which seemed successful initially, with a launch to 10 kilometers planned the very same day. However, this was then scrubbed, and Elon Musk reported on Twitter that additional checkouts on the SN11 vehicle would be required before a reattempt could take place. The next launch attempt for SN11 is now no earlier than today, which means that we will potentially only have to wait a few hours to see it fly. Excitement levels are through the roof. In terms of the other prototypes, SpaceX remain hard at work on constructing Starships SN11 to SN20, not counting the scrapped SN12, 13 and 14 vehicles of course, and super heavy prototypes BN1 and 2, BN1 of course being very exciting to watch at the moment, given that it was fully stacked inside the high bay on the 18th of March. It's not going to perform a flight test, as is expected with BN2, but is merely a pathfinder vehicle to help SpaceX figure out the logistics involved in the fabrication and transportation of a 70 meter tall steel rocket. We may get to see it undergo cryo testing, but my eyes are on the BN2, which is currently under construction. If BN2 is successful, then BN3 may launch the currently under construction Starship SN20 in what will be the vehicle's first ever orbital flight. My my, it's incredible, the pace at which SpaceX are speedrunning rocket development with the Starship. Now that's it for my updates on the construction of Starship, though I think next Monday's episode will be a lot more exciting to reflect on, given that we're expecting either the Starship to fly today, or very, very, very soon. How do you think the flight will go? Will it hit the ground too hard and explode, like the SN8 and SN9, or will it land in one-ish piece, like the SN10, and hopefully not explode this time. Let me know what you reckon down below, but with all the major Starship developments from last week out of the way, let's now begin our coverage of all the other things that happened last week. Last week we were truly spoiled for launches, we had quite a few, the first of which was on the 22nd of March, which was the first fully commercial mission launched by GK Launch Services, a subsidiary of Roscosmos, which is the Russian state-run space service, think the equivalent of NASA in Russia. The rocket was a Soyuz 2.1, which launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. On board was a variety of satellites from different nations. I've already gone through the list on the last two episodes of Space this week, and rather than just speed read a list of nations again, I'm just going to put a table on screen for you to have a look at. Pause the video if you want to. One of the more noteworthy passengers was the Challenge 1, which is the first ever Tunisian satellite made for the Internet of Things. Also aboard was the Japanese ELSA-D, which will demonstrate space debris removal technology. I am very pleased to say that the launch was a success, with all satellites deployed and operational. Soyuz wasn't the only launch on the 22nd of March, we also had Rocket Lab's latest Electron mission, titled They Go Up So Fast. <laughs> the mission successfully launched from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, and all payloads successfully made it to low Earth orbit, where they are now all operational. A full payload list is on screen, a noteworthy passenger there being Pathstone, which is Rocket Lab's second photon satellite, which will be used to perform tests in preparation for their upcoming Capstone mission, which 
which will launch a 12-unit CubeSat to lunar orbit that will test a navigation system to its position to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter without relying on ground stations, as well as test and verify the calculated orbital stability planned for the Gateway Space Station. A very exciting mission to look forward to, and hopefully last week's photon launch will gather good data to adequately prepare for it. On the 24th of March, SpaceX launched their latest Starlink mission, Starlink L-22. The Falcon 9 rocket launched from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and the first stage of the Falcon 9 successfully landed 633 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, completing this first stage's sixth flight overall. The 60 Starlink satellites were successfully deployed into low Earth orbit by the second stage. The fairings of the mission were recovered by SpaceX's brand new recovery ship, Sheila Bordelon. As you can see, she doesn't sport the iconic nets of Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief. Instead, she's designed to simply scoop the fairings from the water. And that's because, and I say this with a very heavy heart, SpaceX would appear to have decided that catching falling fairings with a net is not really worth doing anymore, and has such retired Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief. We saw much of the vessels undergo de-netting and deconstruction over the course of last week, which brings an end to an era then. Albeit a short era, but one that did give us this awesome video of the fairing catchers in action. Miss Tree and Miss Chief will be missed by all, I am sure. On the 25th of March, we had the launch of another Soyuz 2.1. This was operated by Ariane Space and launched from the Vostokny Launch Complex in Russia. The payload was 36 satellites for the British OneWeb satellite constellation, bringing the total number of satellites in the constellation to 146. The OneWeb satellites are a joint venture between OneWeb and Airbus and are low Earth orbit communication satellites. It's hardly a surprise to see a Soyuz launch go well. We see these things launching in freaking blizzards without a problem, but it's always good to report on a successful rocket launch nonetheless. It's also actually the final rocket launch of the week, of many, admittedly. <laughs> Which was your favourite? Let me know down below. Me personally, it's got to be Rocket Lab. I just love their mission names and that's the sole reason I'm picking that one as my favourite. Anyway, let's move along to our next segment, all the launches we can expect to see over the next seven days. This segment is actually going to be fairly short because we only have one launch. I guess that does at least give us more time to unwind after last week's insane launch schedule. The only orbital launch expected this week is a Long March 4C, which will launch from Launch Area 4 at the Juquan Launch Complex in China. The payload will be a GFN-12 Earth Observation Satellite and will be delivered to low Earth orbit. And that's it. Like I said, fairly quiet week really. I guess I could also add Starship SN11 to this list, though it's not going to be heading for space. And of course, we already covered that one in the Starship segment. I guess there's a non-zero chance Blue Origin will give us a last minute New Shepard launch, as they have been planning on launching the mission RSS First Step at some point in late March to late April, though it would be highly irregular to not give us more than a week's notice for a launch. Anyway, while there's not a lot of launches due for this week this year, there is still a lot of activity over the next seven days when reflecting back over the course of spaceflight history. That's right, let's segue to our final section, all the most interesting historic anniversaries that are set to take place over the next seven days. Today, the 29th of March, marks the 1974 anniversary of NASA's Mariner 10, which on this day became the first space probe to fly by Mercury. In the same moment, it also became the first spacecraft to perform flybys of multiple planets, having made use of a gravity assist from Venus to lower its perihelion down to the level of Mercury's orbit. Other firsts netted by this mission included the first ever use of a gravity assist, the first probe to use the solar wind as a major means of spacecraft orientation during flight, the first spacecraft to return data on a long period comet, and the first spacecraft to return to its target after an initial encounter. This last point refers to the resultant orbit from the Venus Gravity Assist, which put Mariner 10 on a course that would result in three separate encounters with the planet Mercury, providing ample opportunity to take various scientific measurements and data gathering. In total, it took nearly 3,000 photographs, revealing a very moon-like surface, and it also discovered that Mercury has a very thin atmosphere, comprised mostly of helium. All in all, a very landmark mission, and as the last of the Mariner series of missions, it certainly ended the program on a high note. 
Tomorrow, on the 30th of March, we'll see the 2017 anniversary of the first ever reflight of an orbital class rocket. This was, of course, SpaceX's Falcon 9, with the B-1021 first stage booster. The B-1021 was first launched in April 2016 on a crew resupply mission to the International Space Station, landing successfully on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. Its second flight was almost a full year later, carrying an SES-10 communication satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit. Amazingly, not only was the reflight a success, but the booster then pulled off a second successful touchdown on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, truly making history. The booster was then retired in view of its historic achievements and was sent as a gift to Cape Canaveral for display. The eventual plan is to have it on a permanent display stand for the general public, feeling right at home I'm sure alongside all of the other recovered space hardware on display at the Kennedy Space Center. On the 31st of March in 1966, the Soviet Union launched Luna 10 which would go on to become the first spacecraft to enter orbit around the moon. It conducted extensive scientific study using an array of devices that included a magnetometer, a meteorite detector, solar plasma analysis instruments, and infrared emission detectors. The probe was battery-powered and operated for 460 lunar orbits and 219 data transmissions before contact was discontinued at the end of May 1966. On the 31st of March in 1970, Explorer one re-entered the Earth's atmosphere after spending 12 years in orbit. The probe was first launched in February 1958, and this was the first satellite launched by the United States, and third overall after the Soviet Sputnik 1 and 2. It was the first spacecraft to detect the Van Allen radiation belt, and it returned data back to Earth for about four months, after which its battery supply ran out. Explorer 1 remains a huge part in the history of space exploration, and was followed by more than 90 scientific spacecraft in the Explorer's program. Sunday, the 4th of April, marks two NASA anniversaries. The first is the 1968 launch of Apollo 6, which was an uncrewed launch designed to demonstrate the translunar injection capability of the Saturn V rocket, with a simulated payload equal to about 80% mass of a full Apollo spacecraft. Here's a photo of the launch, and I know that this is the right Apollo mission launch photo by the white painted service module, which differs from the iconic silver seen on other flights and, of course, on everyone favourite Lego set. <laughs> the flight suffered from a phenomenon known as pogo oscillation, a kind of vibration caused by rocket engines which damaged some of the J2 engines in the second and third stages of the Saturn V. The Saturn V's guidance system was able to compensate by burning the second and third stages for slightly longer, although this resulted in a more elliptical than planned orbit. Furthermore, the damaged third stage engine failed to reignite for translunar injection. Despite these failures, NASA felt that the flight provided sufficient confidence to certify the Saturn V for crewed launches, since Apollo 4 had already demonstrated a restart of the third stage engine. The other NASA anniversary for April the 4th was the 1983 launch of STS-6, which was Space Shuttle Challenger's maiden voyage into space. Challenger was the second ever Space Shuttle orbiter, after the Columbia, and on this mission it deployed the first tracking and data relay satellite into orbit before landing at Edwards Air Force Base on the 9th of April. The mission was also the first Space Shuttle mission to feature a spacewalk, and therefore by extension the first time the extravehicular mobility unit was used. Challenger was ultimately launched and landed more than eight times before tragically disintegrating 73 seconds into its 10th mission in January 1986, resulting in in the death of all seven crew members. Challenger would be the first of two space shuttles destroyed in flight, the other being Columbia, which was destroyed on re-entry in 2003. Now, the maiden voyage of Challenger is the final noteworthy anniversary to take place this week, which brings an end to our coverage of space history this week. <laughs> Wow, what a week! Quite a lot of launches really, some big, some small, but all very exciting spectacles to behold. 2021 is certainly shaping up to be a great year for space enthusiasts, and with so many things to look forward to in the not too distant future, such as the flight of Ingenuity and the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, things certainly don't look like they'll be slowing down anytime soon. 
If you want to watch more from this channel, there are now two things on screen. The left is a video from me that YouTube's AI thinks you'll like, and on the right is my most recent upload, which is most likely my latest Kerbal mission. Check that out if you haven't already, I think it's a good one. Otherwise, check out my social media and merchandise pages in the description, and tune in on Wednesday for a cheeky midweek bonus video. Uh, goodbye! <laughs>